Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. I am back again for another Ask Me Anything. Uh, the rules are comment below this video and I'll get back to you next week. Um, house admin first. Uh, apologies for not getting uh, last week's video done. I had a family thing come up so couldn't do the video. Uh, what has happened since then? Oh, since my last video, uh, my latest loops pack for Loop Masters has come out now. Uh, actually, I've got it open in a tab here. I don't even know if you can see my screen. You can probably just about see something. Uh, head to loopmasters.com. It's Dom Kane Presents Melodic House and Techno. Um, I spent a long time putting together various melodies and bass lines and chords and I've stuck to some key keys uh, so they should kind of work together for the most part um, there's lots of effects in there there's arps there's drum loops there's top line drum loops synths uh, you name it it's all in there um, a lot of my Moog as well um, in fact my various Moogs and a couple of outboard synths. Um, a lot of it's been processed as well on outboard gear. So uh, yeah, hope you like it. Go check it out. There's a uh, there's a demo track on the website. I think they do like a free sample of the pack. I think they give you like I don't know, 10, 15 loops, something like that. But yeah, please do check that out. Uh, what else have I done? Been doing a few mix downs, in fact, uh, just done a mix down for one of the followers of this vlog, Dale. Big ups to you. Um, <clears throat> that was a really fun track, actually. Uh, what else have I been doing? That's probably about it, other than the usual stuff. Uh, so, right, where are we? Let's have a look. Uh, I haven't even previewed these comments, so I don't know what's in here. Uh, start at the top, Med. Hi Dom, I've been making music three years. I use only headphones, but the problem with headphones, you can't work with them for a long time. I get tired quickly. This is the first time I'll buy speakers, so I have the choice between KRK Rocket 5s, Yamaha HS5 and M Audio BX5. In your opinion, how to choose the right monitors? And then you've put in brackets, in the final, I bought Samsung Resolve RX A5. So have you bought them already or I'm sure it doesn't matter because the question is how do you choose the right monitors? So first of all, going back to headphones, uh, yeah, uh, some producers can write music in hotels on earphones and whatever. Uh, I, I, I've got a lot of respect for those guys. I have no idea how they do that. I can't. I, I've got various pairs of headphones around. Um, and I, I guess I can write with them, but I just, I struggle. Um, I find that headphones don't really give you the full balance of things. And I don't think I've ever found a pair of headphones that are affordable, um, that give you a decent frequency response. So yeah, for me personally, I, you know, I, I would never say to someone don't work on headphones because if that's your only choice, that's your only choice. You know, if you're in a house with thin walls or whatever the case, you know, and you're up at four in the morning, then you've got to work on headphones. Um, so I would never say don't do it. One thing I would say though, is if you are only producing on headphones and you don't have any better option, uh, it's always worth considering getting a professional mix down and or master um, if you're putting it out on well not even labels if you're self-releasing or whatever um, it's worth getting that professional finish because I do think with headphones you are missing a few bits um, having said that staying on track of headphones I've got some Bayer Dynamics I can't quite reach them at the moment but they're the DT770 Pros um, I think they're probably the best affordable sort of budget headphones that I've come across. Um, and I'm saying that because you said you can't work with them a long time because you get tired quickly. Um, the Bayer Dynamics, 
I mean, I've been in studios tracking with those uh, where someone's needed to listen to something else in the control room and I'm sort of just engineering in the back uh, if you're with a band or whatever and I can wear those uh, pretty much all day and I just don't they don't hurt my head or anything so that's one of the big reasons for buying them uh, so yeah so I highly recommend those um, KRK Rockets, Yamaha HS5, M Audio BX5 they're all kind of in the same price line as far as I'm aware um, I know a lot of people go with KRKs I think if I'm totally honest that's probably because they look good um, I don't. I haven't heard those three side by side, so I couldn't couldn't tell you which one to go for. But as for your question, how to choose the right monitors, this is one of those times where internet shopping sort of lets us down. I think. Um, do you know what I always tell people? Find a good shop that you can walk into, um, preferably one that supplies all two or three or whatever speakers that you're looking at and you know phone them up in advance tell them i'm you know i'm looking to purchase one of these sets i need to hear them side by side to to get the sale uh you know it's pretty straightforward so sorry i haven't silenced my phone um yeah so it's pretty straightforward you know they should be able to do that and if they can't then try someone else um because nothing beats walking into a shop and them sitting you down with all the speakers side by side and you can play your own music um, and really listen to what the differences are. Is one of them a bit bass heavy? I, I know from my experience when I first started and was getting sort of the lower budget speakers, some of them would sound too good and when you listen to them you think oh this sounds great you've got to be careful of that um what you want it to do is to sound good but revealing and i and i, I don't know how how to put that into words um yeah you need to find a set of speakers that uh give you some good bass and some good treble but by good i mean not pleasing but just flat so you need to be able to hear the low end bass and you need to be able to hear what's going on you need to hear all the the little transients of hi-hats um you know and listen to those little details but also listen to the balance um you know does everything sound good in the stereo field or, or are you hearing um you know does it sound nice and wide i suppose um and you kind of need to know the production you're listening to in the first place to to get that so you know pick a track whatever it is it could be of a professional artist that you know is going to be a great production or it could be one of your own that one of your own that you know intimately um and just listen to it a thousand times in a row on your own on headphones on your mum's cassette player whatever and then go to the shop and listen to it in those three sets of speakers and and work out is are, are any of those speakers um, giving you some detail that you're suddenly going oh this bass line needs a bit of work or you know because if it's making you think then it's probably a good thing uh, so yeah hopefully that answers your question Ben Bainbridge uh, hi Dom thanks for the response we'll give Fat Freddy's drop a listen do uh, in fact they're in the UK at the moment they're in Manchester November 3rd and 4th because um, they're New Zealand based uh, do you have any go-to plugins you use for sound design work when it's not for a specific synth and do you use Bitwig for its modular capabilities oh and zoom high five um, do you have any plugins you use for sound design work so I don't really have any go-to plugins necessarily I did have a Kima Pacarana uh, now only the really nerdy of you would know what that is um, it's I guess most of you will maybe know what max MSP is uh, so it's object orientated uh, development stuff uh, the Kima Pacarana is a bit of hardware that plugs in through Firewire and has its own sound card uh, and is 
sort of specifically designed to run DSP modules um, and you can do all sorts of fantastic things. In fact, I'll give you an example, most of the sound effects for Star Wars, uh, the voice of Wally um, and obviously Eva was done using the Kima Pakarana uh, because you can manipulate, um, I can't remember how that voice was done now, I think it was a Fast Fourier Transform mix. Um, but you could have, for example, um, I forget what they used, I, I only saw it in a clip years and years ago, but it was something along the lines of, I'll say, a recording of a washing machine or something like that, and they modulated the voice against a washing machine to create the robot voice. So uh, I did use the Kima Pakarana a lot and then found I kind of just wasn't using it enough, so got rid of that. Um, I, I can't think of a single plugin that's a standout for me. Um, I suppose Reactor is a good one when you start building your own modules. Uh, Max MSP, in fact, I've mentioned, I, I do a fair bit on that. It really depends on what kind of sound design we're talking about. Are we talking sound design for a computer game or sound design for music? Um, I guess they're two very different things, really. Um, do you use Bitwig for its modular capabilities? Yes, I love Bitwig for its modular capabilities. And in fact, 2.4 is out now, so if any of you haven't got that, I highly recommend it. Uh, they've chucked a few more features, but the biggest thing, I've only uh, installed it yesterday because I've been working on projects and I, I refuse to upgrade anything on my computer while I'm working on a project just in case something goes wrong. Um, however, finished a bunch of projects yesterday. Uh, obviously it's Thursday yesterday, so updated Bitwig and I'm really impressed with the loading time. Um, I know that's a bit of a nerdy thing to be impressed by, but everything seems to load so much faster. Uh, so yeah, that answers that. Zombo, just brought Bitwig. Uh, what do you recommend I try out? Uh, I love the feature that if a plugin crashes, the whole door doesn't yet. I mean, that's a huge feature. And that's one of the advantages of a team like the guys at Bitwig who've built a, a DAW in the modern age is that they know that those are the things that annoyed Logic, Cubase, Nuendo, Fruity Loops, Ableton users is the crashes. Um, you know, when you're dealing with a multitude of plugins and third party software, um, you know, why not build an entirely different audio engine for that? So that's a huge advantage of Bitwig. Um, as for recommending what you try out, um, I, nothing, just in, enjoy it, just experiment, I would say. Whenever you get a new workstation, um, you know, I always recommend you, you spend a couple of weeks full time. So whatever that is in for, for people, if you have a day job, then, you know, longer, a few months or so. And just make some silly music, make some nonsense. Don't try and push yourself into making a fully polished production because it's just not going to happen straight away. You're better off just experimenting and saying, right, what's the weirdest sound I can make? Let's let's make this bass line and, and right, that sounds okay, but now I'm going to drop in a bunch of modular stuff. So drop in... Uh, something like reverb on a bass line, which you shouldn't do normally. Uh, so shove in some reverb on a bass line and then you'll see the little arrow uh, to drop in uh, a modular unit and it'll bring up a, a, a menu so you can drop in, I don't know, a classic LFO or a amplitude follower or something like that, an envelope follower. And then assign that to some random parameter like the wet dry or Whatever, just experiment and go mad. That's my advice. Uh, I can see someone's commented here, Kava K. Uh, good move, Zombo. Uh, just to hijack Don's upcoming comments. Personally, I'd recommend getting familiar with Bitwig's modulators. Yeah, that's what I just said. Uh, they're hugely powerful when you get to grips with them, especially when you realize you can modulate other modulators. Yes, and you can have three modulators within one modulator and then modulate that to more. I mean, it's just, you know, it goes on. Uh, 
Also, if you put your modulators in the first plugin of a chain, you can modulate stuff within the effects chain as well using the same modulators. Yes, yeah, so where you have on Ableton it looks similar, but I'll talk about bit. You drop a device in, let's say, reverb, and then you can drop in, uh, let's say, delay after the reverb. Now that's normal on most workstations. On Bitwig, in the top right of the reverb, you you have a little box that says effects. You can drop the delay on that instead, and that now becomes chained to the reverb, which means you can then open the modulators of the reverb and modulate something within the the delay or whatever I said for the plugin. Um, so yeah, so you can really you know you can get your 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 effects devices kind of talking to each other, I suppose. Uh, also, be aware of the polarity switch. Yes, so if you have a sine wave LFO and it's on pitch, which is at zero, then it's going swinging plus and minus, hit the polarity and it just goes to zero and up or down or whatever. Uh, also, if you've bought from Bitwig themselves or a reseller, you should have 12 months of upgrades, which will include the imminent version 2.4, which I just mentioned. Uh, the update to the native sampler is worth the upgrade alone. Interesting, I've not looked at the sampler yet. Uh, the plugin sandbox feature is brilliant, has literally saved me hours of work to recover a project to the state uh, before a plugin crash. Yeah, perfect, good answer. Uh, next question, Cake C. Hey Dom, uh, thanks for these great vids, man. You're welcome. Uh, they have helped me a lot in my productions. I was wondering if you had any idea on how artists like No Manor seem to have the sounds in their music pop out at you uh, while you're listening. His tracks 9, BRB, Back Alley, Time Machine especially have this. Slow Motion has it a little too. It's usually the bass sound uh, that does this, but his breaks, effects, interrupt synths also do this too. So I think, uh, in fact, I'll finish that. Some of Deadmau5's songs do it, but it seems as if No Mana does it on almost all of his tracks. It's almost 3D sounding and stereo sounding, uh, like the Exford Dimension Expander. It could be the dimension expander um you have uh there's a plugin called stereo savage i think uh yeah that, i think that's credland audio one uh you have um basically what you're looking for is is tube saturation i would say um i think and i i don't know because i haven't spoken to jordan about how he does his productions but I I assume it's probably something along the lines of Dimension Expander or um, I, because a lot of his tracks off the top of my head without listening at the moment um, a lot of his tracks come across almost I want to say 8-bitty in sound it's probably a wrong way to describe it but it's that that heavily saturated thing going on um, which quite often gives the appearance of sounding really wide so it's probably something along those lines also i've pro i've mentioned this loads of times on this this channel before um picking the right sounds in the first place chances are no manner has uh, a sort of a bank of sounds that he knows he's going for um he knows what kind of sound he's going to end up with so he knows what kind of samples to listen out for when he's if he downloads a sample library or whatever chances are he's looking for a very specific sound that has that crunch and that punch in there in the first place so a lot of it comes down to just picking the right sounds in the first place and I, advice to everyone there don't try and reinvent the wheel um if you're going for a specific sound find sounds that already have that you know so if you're going through a, a, a sample library if you're if you want i'll give you a really basic example if you want a really punchy kick drum that that has a huge body and and power to it it's absolutely pointless to grab an 808 drum machine record the kick drum and then apply a compressor a distortion some saturation some tube drive maybe a dimension expander a, another couple of compressors a limiter pointless why bother that's you know why would you spend all that time trying to get a kick drum to sound big and punchy when you can go somewhere like Loopmasters and download 
a million different kick drums and find one that's already punchy. Um, or uh, Sonic Academy's Kick 2 is one of my favourites uh, for designing kick drums. You know, there's already some great presets in there that have a load of punch. Grab one of those and maybe just tweak it a bit to, to suit your needs. Um, like I say, not everything has to be started from scratch. Um, you know, there's no point reinventing the wheel. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers it. Uh, Kavake, cheers Dom, short but sweet, still a good un. zoom, high five. A really important point about there being room for all sorts of taste within the music market. Uh, if we all like the same stuff, the world would be an awfully dull place. Ain't that the truth? I recommend you don't Google Timmy Trumpet. Oh yeah, this was the Timmy Trumpet thing if you haven't seen last week's video. Uh, you went to a festival, uh, somebody was uh, playing there called Timmy Trumpet, which I, I still think is a hilarious name. Um, and it was crap. Uh, you can you can never unhear that crap. There we go. How are you like in Manchester? Love it. Loads of good places to eat around Didsbury and Chalton. Okay, I'll check them out. Uh, I, I've barely had time to scratch my ass since I've been here, to be honest. Um, I'm still uh, looking at building the studio out in the back. Uh, had a guy around yesterday taking some measurements for the garden and whatever and hopefully getting quotes coming through so I'm moving forward with it slowly but surely. Oh also I mentioned before I probably should have mentioned this in house admin um, I mentioned before that I'll probably go for a prefab place I don't think I'm going to now because the measurements don't add up so I might be building it from scratch which I really don't want to do but it, I, you know if you want it done right you have to do it yourself. Uh, P.S. Fat Freddy's Drop, high five. I remember hearing them uh, in New Zealand, which is where I said they're from, around 2000-ish. They're amazing. Yes, they are. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, two of my favourite all-time tracks are Mother Mother and Hope. Uh, feel the beats. First of all, I love your music. The quality of your tracks is huge and I can't wait to hear new upcoming songs from you. Thank you very much. Uh, you are really humble as a person and I like that a lot. Uh, also, I like uh, so much this kind of videos that you put. Uh, it's almost like some sort of free interview and I appreciate the time and opportunity you give us to talk to you. So thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Uh, I have a question about mixing. It may seem very simple and that's because I'm starting out anyway. So when wanting to get rid of harshness from a static single tone, uh, sound like a shaker or hi-hat, do you recommend using a compressor to get rid of some of the attack harshness or is it better to just lower the high frequencies with an EQ? Have a nice day and zoom high five. <clears throat> That's a difficult question. That's a good question actually and it's a difficult one to answer without hearing the specific sound you're talking about. Um, I guess first of all kind of what I was saying earlier, if you want to reduce the harshness of something like a hi-hat, use a different hi-hat, use a different shaker, find one that isn't as harsh. Uh, failing that, I would probably say on a hi-hat or a shaker, uh, what did you mention? Lower the high frequencies. I would say lower the low frequencies, stick it through a high-pass filter and push that filter all the way up to whatever 10k or something like that um, because the harshness is usually between 1 and 5 kilohertz um, so I would say scoop that out um, and you might find that it suddenly sounds a bit cleaner um, I wouldn't use a compressor myself um, there's no need to compress a hi-hat because, um, and I and I realise a lot of people do this, they use a compressor on something like a hi-hat. Um, a hi-hat doesn't need compression, unless it's an acoustic recording, and in which case you're level matching, that's different. But in the digital world, in electronic music, you shouldn't need a compressor on a hi-hat. Uh, if you wanted to raise or drop the attack, I would suggest use a, 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 a transient shaper. Uh, Native Instruments have got one, and I use that quite a bit, that's a good one. Uh, otherwise, if you're in Bitwig, you've got one built in, uh, so use that. Um, 
and then you can adjust the sustain but basically play with the attack if you want to you know uh, again sometimes it depends on where the harshness is is in a hi-hat could be at the transient could be in the body so bring the attack down if that doesn't fix it bring the attack up and then bring the gain down so it's just a, a sharper click um, I think that's probably all I would suggest for something like that yeah so hopefully that helps uh, Bavaro or Bavar Zero. Uh, thanks so much for the response, Dom. Very insightful. Cheers. Cool. Can't remember the question, but you're welcome. PWM Music. Hey man, a few videos back you talked about some library music you were working on for Nature Documentary, I think. Did you complete this and how did you approach structure and sound selection for that kind of music and fitting a library album inside your schedule? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I did... Um so music for so it was for various documentaries it wasn't nature documentaries I hope I didn't say that um, but if I did then I'm wrong uh, it wasn't nature documentaries uh, so this was for a company that specifically create albums to pitch to specific TV film whatever um, so what they do is they tend to put together an album with no one company or production in mind. So let's say, for example, uh, you wanted to do a f futuristic documentaries, then you would create the album of, say, 20 tracks that are all futuristic and, you know, let's say like Blade Runner-esque or whatever, um, and then you would search you would send, submit that to the company then the company go out and search production companies and they send that album out saying hey we've made this album if you need it on any of your documentaries and they'll aim for companies that are renowned for making futuristic documentaries if there are such a thing um so uh, uh, did you complete this yes i did and how do you approach structure and sound selection for that kind of music um so there were the one i did was uh, actually quite, I say easy, it was easy because it, I had a brief that told me what they were looking for. Um, so it was simple in terms of instructions. Uh, they chose specific countries and the idea was to do say 20 tracks, 20 countries um, and a bunch of writers get in together on it. Sorry about that, uh, my camera cuts out after half an hour. Uh, where was I? I was talking about the documentary, blah, 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 blah. Right, yeah, so it was 20 tracks, 20 countries, and it's electronic dance music, and it needs to have just a slight twist of said country. So uh, I'll give you an example that I didn't do, uh, that didn't exist, but so for example, let's say uh, the country was... Kenya. So you would look into what traditional instruments are used in Kenya uh, along like the percussive stuff and then you'd use maybe a, a, a slight African rhythm um, and some Kenyan drum sounds but it would it would be predominantly a, a, a dance track that you'd expect to hear in the background of uh, you know something like a, a BBC travel show or something like that you know so when they go to Kenya they can drop that in in the background and it's not too obvious but there's just a slight twist to it so yeah so in terms of structure and sound selection for that I think it's kind of self-explanatory um, yeah it's um, it's a case of sort of finding samples and there are various sources I use uh, for doing that uh, Sometimes it involves me, you know, getting a session musician in and sort of recording and sampling some real acoustic instruments. Uh, um, yeah, there's been a few where I've had to do something along those lines. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of different every time. But, uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, next question, L7. Uh, do you have any new music coming out anytime soon? So... <laughs> My plan was, I had my EP come out on Mousetrap the beginning of this year-ish, February. Um, and my plan was to sort of drop 
a couple of singles and then another EP towards autumn of this year. Um, <clears throat> that plan, plan went horribly awry, uh, as it always does when I try and plan my career. Um, it, so I did a single which some of you will have heard, and I can't remember how, uh, called Voices in My Head. Um, I think there's some clips of that on my Facebook page, not sure. Um, that was originally scheduled to come out around June, something like that. So then I was going to do another one around now or maybe sort of August and then EP in a couple of months. Um, <clears throat> that voices in my head got pushed back to what was then supposed to be August and I thought, OK, I'll leave the other single and not bother. I'll do other stuff. Uh, and then that got pushed to like October and now it's December or something like that. So now I'm at a point where I'm like, OK, I, voices in my head, I think will be out December. But that's pushed another single and an EP back. So I'm now sort of working on my second EP. And what I'm hoping is I'll maybe do like five tracks for it, hoping it'll be a three track EP. And then whichever one doesn't get picked or there'll be two not picked for the EP. One of those I might put out as a single all far too complicated um but that's the way it is um so in answer to your question voices in my head some of you know about uh that is now being pushed to december so i'm probably gonna try and do another single and either self-release maybe i don't like doing that but i might who knows uh otherwise i might work with uh someone like Wartone or something and put it out through them so that we can get it way before December. Then Voices in My Head will be the second single of just coming out for December and then I'll have to push the EP to say beginning of next year, which is not too long, but hey, that's it. Uh, Daddy Custard, first to zoom, boom, high five. Uh, Dead Mouse Cinco, the Mexican Dead Mouse. Uh, hey Dom, I've enjoyed the video. Thanks for answering my question. By the way, not Mexican dead mouse. I'm from Croatia. Hope you'll visit one day. Yeah, I, I have heard so much good stuff about Croatia um, and I've seen a lot of friends playing amazing gigs out there. So I'm well up for that. Somebody book me. Uh, do you ever give feedbacks on some tracks? If so, where could I or somebody else reach you? Thanks ahead for the response. Uh, yes, I do through uh, Audiu, uh, A-U-D-I-U dot net. Yeah, dot net. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I would suggest going through there. So, um you know, it's not it's not free. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to be clickbaity. Um, it's paid for reviews. Uh, it's just the only way I can find the time to do it, if I'm totally honest. You know, um, I'm sure some of you can imagine I get a lot of people sending me uh, their music and asking for feedback. Uh, if I was to do it on every single one, it would be two full time jobs. It's just not something I can do. Um, Whereas through Audio, and not just because of that, but here's the main reason I use Audio is they have structured comments. So you load up the boxes and it's first impressions, strongest point, weakest point, um, mix down professionalism, market appeal, sound design and, and choices, uh, arrangement and they're all separated by different boxes that I can fill in so I can sort of really analyze the track in detail and I can say right this arrangement you know that I have done a few this week or last week I think it was um, where for example uh, someone had put in a track that was I think it was like five and a half six minutes long but it was a really commercial track and they were aiming for like a radio edit and so, you know, things like that, you can go, right, well, the arrangement, I think you need to sort of bring it down to like three minutes or whatever, and then just have an extended club version. Um, and in which case, I really like this breakdown, but this breakdown you could maybe take out and then 
you know, in your intro rather than having this part, you could have this and you can get into as much detail as you want. <coughs> so I really like using that system. Uh, so yeah, there we go. If you want your tracks reviewed by me, head to audiu.net. Uh, Janice Lokmenis, uh, Zoom, high five, Rod Marconi, Zoom, high five, unknown artist. Hi Dom, love your music, you're an inspiration. Uh, that baffles me, but thank you. Um, I'm wondering how you go about arranging your tracks. What do you start with? We're nearly done, by the way, guys. I think this is probably going to be a fairly long video because it's been a couple of weeks, but uh, arranging my tracks. Where do you start? Um, good question. I don't know. I, I think so. A lot of people ask me this, actually. And, and I'm, so I'm I've never paid much attention to how I arrange my own tracks or where I start in the production process. And and yet every interview and stuff, I'm, I'm asked that same question. And I always give this really vague answer because I don't I don't really know the answer. There isn't there isn't a set thing that I do that I'm aware of. I don't pay enough attention. Um, but I, more recently I've tried and I have noticed myself, I tend to work on a melody idea first and that melody idea, although this is not the way you're supposed to do it, you're supposed to start with a melody and then build chords underneath. I tend to start with chords and then build a melody on top. Um, I'm sure it doesn't really matter either way, but that's just how I tend to work. And then from there I kind of envisage that being the breakdown which is why you'll probably notice uh, a fair few of my tracks the breakdown has all the melody in and then when the drums come in and what you could call a drop I suppose um, that tends not to have so much melody uh, or it might just hint at the melody coming in for the breakdown something along those lines uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons is because I start with the melody and I build uh, a breakdown moment and then it's from there I decide right where do I want this track to go do I want it to keep the the tonic note of that chord phrase to become the bass line in which case I, I know you know roughly the vibe of the track and where it's going to go with that um, or do I uh, do I want to just cut everything out and then drop into big drums? Um, so that's kind of how I sort of self predict where my track's going to go. Um, as for full arrangement, again, that's kind of tricky, I suppose. But I t again, I tend to start with the breakdown. I'll shift it over to the right, knowing that that's where the breakdown is going to be. Uh, then I might work backwards from there. So I'll, I'll build up to the drop create the drum groove, get everything, percussion and everything going, and then I'll use that before the breakdown and paste it in, but then remove some of the elements and then maybe drop in hints of the melody. So for example, if I'm using this big thick lead with a couple of arpeggiators and some chord progressions in the breakdown, then I'll just drop the lead and maybe change the instrument or just filter it slightly so that it kind of hints and I'll maybe have some more reverb so that it creeps in a bit more or maybe just bring in the ARP and develop that. Um, and then I kind of work backwards from there doing the intro um, because most of my tracks are sort of club ready tracks. Um, um, apart from one that I've just written, hopefully for my EP, um, which is not club ready. Um, but yeah, so I'll sort of work with the drums and filter them out or filter them in, but working backwards, filter them out. Um, so everything kind of builds towards that drop and then it's anyone's guess what happens after that really. So yeah, that's kind of how I go about arranging it. In terms of overall arrangement, I try to pay attention to how long the track is. Uh, most of my tracks you'll notice are between sort of six and seven and a half minutes. They're quite long, they're quite proggy, uh, they're quite ploddy and, and that's the, the general vibe I like going for. Um, I couldn't tell you the last time I wrote a track of under my own name that was sort of four minutes long or whatever but that seems to be a thing these days um, and it's something I'm quite keen to looking into at some point um, but as for tricks as a bit of advice for anyone who gets stuck with their arrangement 
find a track that you love that is the length you want to aim for and kind of copy their arrangement so so load it import it to your workstation say you've got bitwig stick it on the top track but mute it obviously um and in fact first of all solo it and just listen to the track and grab your scissor tool and just put some chops in so that's the intro that's the we'll call it verse one that's the we'll call it chorus that's a middle eight that's the breakdown that's the drop whatever you know name it color code it whatever you want to do with it and then mute that channel and then sort of look at your arrangement and go right well on their track this arrangement works you know i've got similar elements to my track uh then you can start sort of chopping your track up and going right well the breakdown on theirs is two and a half minutes in so let's focus as that and then what do, what have they done before it and sort of use theirs as a, a, almost a template um, and then delete their track and then listen to yours and go right does this work in my track if it doesn't tweak it here and there you know ask yourself does this bit get boring after a while or you know does this bit just suddenly change into something where maybe there should have been a better transition there um, and yeah that's probably a, a, the best trick I've got for arrangement then finally last question I think oh an unknown artist has said zoom high five uh, Andrew Hollis hi Don not sure if this has been asked before apologies if it has have you ever one been asked by Bitwig to provide or have provided any presets for the stock synths within Bitwig uh, they haven't out and out asked me but I have had conversations with them about it and I think due to timings of either their projects or my projects we've not really done anything but never say never uh, I'm definitely up for doing it and I think I need to be able to find the time to put aside to thrash out a plan with them to be able to go right this is what we're aiming for whatever um so yeah it's something i'm i'm aware of and I, I probably will end up doing at some point but um it just hasn't happened yet two uh consider doing any videos on how to get the best out of the synths as they are extremely powerful in version 2.0 i uh, do you know what i haven't really considered that but i have been asked a few times to consider it and i i've never really considered it um Mostly because I think um, there are probably other people out there that do tutorials on these synths and I feel like they could probably do a much better job than I could. Um, so I kind of feel like if I did it, one, I'd just be one of very many and two, I'm not sure I'd be offering anything particularly useful. However... Going back to your question one, if I provided them with uh, some stock preset packs, then I think my answer would be different to question two because yes, I would definitely do some videos, especially for this channel, um, you know, focusing on how I approached it and, and what my goal was and um, yeah. So with this, this video series, um, you know or this video channel i should say um you know i've i've said all along that I, I my whole i think in fact the very first video i put out on this channel sort of explains i didn't want to get too bogged down with just tutorials on this is how to make a skrillex baseline this is how to sound like avici this is how to you know i didn't want it to be step by step instructions i want it to be more of a sort of open platform for you guys to ask me stuff and me to answer stuff and and also you'll notice hopefully the videos that I have put out that aren't this AMA series um, I kind of hope there's a little bit for everyone in there because I sort of talk more about vague approaches to stuff and maybe the mindset behind things so uh, with the Bitwig stock since I've got to be honest I don't use them as much as I probably should um, um, and that's probably just more down to laziness than anything else on my part um, because they are awesome synths and they are powerful I know that um, 
so yeah so I, I maybe I should look into that um, yeah I think um, there's probably a lot I can do with them so uh, yeah I haven't been doing so many sort of videos along those lines recently and it's something I'm very aware of that I, I need to start stepping my game up a bit really um, so yeah I maybe I should have another chat with Bitwig and uh, see where we go with that finally zoom high five and that my friends is it for this week it's been a hellish long video uh, probably about Oh geez, nearly an hour. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to have to get to the cut and upload this thing because it's now Friday, one o'clock in the afternoon. So sorry if it's late. Uh, if you have made it this far, you really truly deserve a gold medal because this has been a long video. Uh, so I am going to say, drop a comment saying GoPro, all one word, GoPro, uh, if you've made it this far into the video. And I will see you this time next week. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers.